Good morning and welcome to another session of Facebook Live with the Malaysian Insight. We have a, today we have a special treat for you as well as for me as we have uh, Tun Dr. Siti Hasma with us this morning. Uh, Tun Dr. Siti Hasma is one of the first Malay women to enroll in a medical course at the King's, at King Edward College 7 in Singapore uh, after World War II. She was also one of the first Malay women doctors in Malaya after graduating in 1955 and stayed on until, 19, until retirement in 1979. Most of us remember Toon City as the Prime Minister's wife and the patron of badminton. The image of Toon City lifting the Thomas Cup in 1992 with the Sidek brothers are uh, still fresh in the mind for most of us who watched that. Um, so I would just like to start off by asking, um, who, is, who is Dr. Hasma? Still, Hasma, and that's why the book is named My Name is Hasma. I should have added um, students as well as women doctors in the service. Yeah, so what is your uh, male doctors, you know, in the service? Well, um, 1955, that's the time when I was I've graduated and uh, came back home to do my housemanship in Kuala Lumpur. General Hospital. I was very, very uh, grateful that uh, I managed to fulfill not only my own ambition to be a doctor, but my father, my parents wish that I should be one. And that uh, I came back, uh, although I, I spent two more years in the college, the, the course is six years actually, Chan, but I failed in my first year and I also have to repeat my final year. Okay, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we had some technical problems just now. Uh, it's been sort sorted out by the team and uh, we are back with Toon Dr. Siti Hasma. She was just telling us about how she started in GHKL and, um, and as a houseman those years. And then shortly, I think, in, is it 1956, um, you moved to Kedah? After we got married, 56, yes. So how was it like moving, I mean, being a city person um, and moving to Kedah? You know, those days, Kedah must have been very Rural, different. very rural town. Yes. But it, that's the challenge. It's not the, my colleagues that will, be, that will be challenging me, but it's the challenge of the environment and the people uh, whom I serve. That's the challenge. And uh, I was very, very grateful when I found that I was born a girl, a Muslim at that, and uh, became a doctor. That was the correct time, God bless me with, to work with the rural people in Kedah, because the situation is much worse than in Kuala Lumpur. And for me, as a town-bred girl, going to a rural is a big challenge. But I faced it, and I was very happy for the number of years I, I worked there. How, how were some of the challenges you had to you know, face in Alostar? First of all, I'm, I can consider myself an expatriate mm -hmm. in Kedah because I don't uh, understand their lingo. Okay? Cakap Kedah lain. And, uh, but uh, I soon began to learn. I had, uh, first, I had an interpreter because I don't know what they mean by Sungai Kecik, Sungai Besar. Okay. And the difficulty that this woman had going to Sungai until the staff nurse told me, he said, Doctor, Sungai Kechi means that she cannot pass urine, and uh, Sungai Besa means the other one, and surely she cannot bring her husband to help her. So, okay, okay, okay. Now I understood. And after that, I started to learn, and I, I humbled myself. That's the, the word. Humbled myself and learned to know how to approach them in that environment. And very soon I got over it, and uh, the rapport between me and my patients was very good. I first worked in the hospital, which is different from the hospital that I worked in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the difference is that in Kuala Lumpur, most of the patients and the mothers who bring their child for treatment are Chinese. They were Chinese. They were the ones who are very alert about health, because they were staying in the city, in the town. But in Kedah, in Alostha, it's mostly the Malays, but they come usually too late. And that's where 
I get sometimes very upset because they come in too late for treatment in a hospital. And then when they come in too late, so what happens? They die. Even though we do the, the first aid or whatever, emergency treatment, they eventually passed away. And then it gives cause to the people, to the people, to say that, huh, must the hospital pun mati ka? Not realizing that they were the ones who do. Now, this is, I don't blame them. This is in the hospital environment that I was there. But when I, when I was transferred to rural, rural health and became a medical officer of health, then I understood why. Why they were came into late. One is that the patient must have the approval of the husband, the mothers, and all the orang-orang tua in the house for her to go to hospital. That's one. Secondly, transportation. Okay? We, they don't have the money. At that time, our road was so bad. This is before the development program. The transportation to go to the clinic or to the hospital is you have to get a private taxi or a car. And uh, to come out from the house to the road is another problem. The roads are very small, bandang roads. You can't bring a car in. So they have to carry the woman in the, in the, up in the sarong and the long poles, okay? right up to the road, and then to wait for a car that, that can take them to the hospital. So these are the problems in the rural areas which I understood when I was with them. And then came the Tun Raza rural program, which actually helped the rural people tremendously. And uh, I was very lucky to be still in government at the time and under Tun Razak's, uh, uh, um, he was a prime minister and he made this rural program and we really abide to his, all his instructions in his red book. We meet as a medical officer of health in, in Kubang Fasu. Uh, we meet at the uh, district officer, uh, district office every month with all the other heads of uh, departments. And we plan out how to expand the rural program. Where I'm concerned is about health. Rumah Bintan, uh, health clinics, and then to, uh, we need to recruit new nurses and train new nurses and so forth. That was my responsibility. That's a challenge which I took <coughs> and uh, I was very, very happy. I managed to get the cooperation of the people, the district officer. I'm the only woman there, but they respect me and I respect them. So for me, I, was, I really thank, uh, I was very grateful to the Almighty because although I'm a woman, but they respect me because of my profession and I guess because I know how to respond to them and approach them as rural folks and uh, uh, ignorant in some ways, but I was there to help them carry on. You, um, just, just talking about the, uh, what do you call it? Are you, are you satisfied with the level of rural health care that we have today? Yes. From, yeah. yeah. Yes, we have the best. We, we, we were considered the best uh, the country with, with the best health program, and we're very proud of it. And uh, especially so, we have many success stories. Ja. Success stories in the form that uh, we brought down the mother's maternal mortality rate down, and the best was the infant mortality rate down. In, 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 during independence, at the time of independence, it was 75 per thousand children below one year who will pass away with diphtheria, which is like I mentioned just now. But uh, by the time we, the health program went, and by the time I left uh, Alusta, it was six per thousand, mm -hmm. seven per thousand. Mm -hmm. I, did, I had to go to Washington mm -hmm. to, uh, to tell them of our success story. Of course, we got um, uh, the budget from the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So they want to know how come. Mm -hmm. So I went. Dr. Rashkarim was with me. We went to tell them the success story of Malaysia. We were the fourth 
country in the developing uh, 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 situation uh, to have got uh, to to show real success in bringing down the infant mortality. The first was Japan, second is Great Britain, third is US, fourth is Malaysia. We were very proud. What was the key to that success? What was the key? Yeah, to bring our down immunization the program. Immunization. Our immunization program. The five. Five uh, uh, vaccines that we have ready for the children, and also we have what we call the initiative mothers, uh, mothers initiative program. Anyone who is got um, who is pregnant, a mother who is pregnant, and has uh, complications, they will be our first priority to attend. They have the free way to go to the hospital to see the doctor, and uh, to discuss whatever treatment you're going to do to them and to help them cross the complication. That is our best program, Initiative Mother's Program, Maternal Program, and uh, the Immunization Program. And thirdly, Chan, you'll never believe this, our registration of the Tok Tok Bidan, oh. the traditional midwives. Mm -hmm. Oh, there are about 1,000 of them in Kedah. Mm -hmm. They are old, and, uh, but they are very active. They are a leader in the kampong. She's the one who we have to be friendly with first, first thing when you go into rural health. It, they, was they, it difficult to deal with the Tobi dance and the... No, for, for me it's not difficult. Okay. But, but it depends on how we approach these old ladies, you know. They panggil kan tok lah, kan? To apa sihat, And once, once they like you, they will listen to you. We give them... UNICEF, beautiful UNICEF aluminium uh, kits, midwifery kit. Kau they will use, you know, the chocolate punya tin, uh -huh. kan, as their midwifery kit. Uh -huh. And then they have one rusty scissors, and then uh, some thread. And then you can find sometimes when we, we examine them every month, there will be cockroach on your legs, kan, or the punya so unhygienic. So we said, okay, we give you an aluminium midwifery kit from UNICEF, complete with the you know, the scissors, the forceps, the thread to tie the umbilical cord, and the medicine to give and so forth. Very clean and the towels get for. And they had to bring the this midwifery kit for inspection every month. Mm. They come, and you see them as brand as new. New, clean, and brand that's new, but they don't use it. So that's the time, that's the challenges that I made. You know, it's a why. It's a big deal. It's not just to take care of the car, it's not just to take care of the car. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. She's working in the big deal. Mm -hmm. And then when, come, when comes a call, say that Cik uh, Mina or someone is is going to deliver, she just washes her hand in the bandang water, goes out, and then passes a bamboo stick to cut the bamboo to prepare for the cutting of the cord. Dengan mm -hmm. bamboo ni. Tangan dia tak bersih. So, we have a lot of problem with them originally mm -hmm. until we give them this aluminium box and speak to them. We have a special course for them and eventually, finally, we register them. Register them as health uh, promoters. You will so know. They also are tired, you know. But the being a f sort of first aiders la, in the in the rural areas, we allow them to do so, but change them to become health promoters. And you say to be done. Uh, her duty after the course is, her duty is to help the patient in con uh, when comforting her uh, when you recite uh, religious verses uh, during delivery. And that's from the umbilical upwards. From the umbilical downwards, it will be our registered, trained government midwife. Mm -hmm. And we want them to cooperate. To be done, we'll call the registered midwife in the company from the company uh, Rumah Bidan and to help someone to deliver and she will also be there to, con to comfort the mother. That's her duty now. And they are very pleased. She's a family planning promoter and brings children for immunization. 
So we have a very good rapport that I don't know what, what is now. I don't think there are many more uh, bidan uh, bidan, uh, traditional midwives, but probably a few you know, in those places which are very far out. But they must be trained. They must be recognized. Don't put them aside. Recognize them so that they feel that they're still useful in the village. They are leaders in the village. The leaders that I have to uh, talk to is Tok Bidan, Tok Kampong, uh, Ketuk Kampong, and uh, Tok Momo. Mm -hmm. the, mom, the Bomo is the one who's very nasty sometimes. And the religious, uh, Tok uh, Pukwai Gama, mm -hmm. Tok Imam, yes. Today we see that uh, there are some professional women who are opting to give birth at home mm -hmm. and then parents who don't want to vaccinate their children. What, what do you think of this as I a feel, person from medical? I feel very sad, Chan. It, actually, frankly, I feel very sad because it uh, bounced back on me. I say, it looks as if my 17 years, 23 years, teaching rural people to rural mothers to please come go to the hospital for delivery, especially if that first delivery probably has gone to waste. And the, and the immunization program also. The benefit that the, the, the children got from the immunization then was gone to waste because of this anti-immunization campaign and also the mothers going, not going to hospital for deliveries. If they are professional ladies, it's okay because they are educated, yeah? But I still would caution them not to have their first delivery or the fourth delivery at home unattended. They said that they, do, they won't want any attendance at the beginning. That worried me. If you are in complication, then you have to call someone. Supposing you are bleeding, you have to call someone. And then comes this, I call it water babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, delivering uh, in 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 water. Mm -hmm. You must have someone attending to you. It may be your husband. It may be a nurse or something to help you. And uh, quite a number are successful. Okay, but those who are not will have either delivered a dead baby, or the mother will be in complications. For so long as the baby born in the water is still under, under, in, in the water, then the baby will be okay. Because from, from a bag of uh, water in the mother's womb into a pool of water or whatever, a bathtub, uh, he will be all right. Because the lungs are still not dilated, not, not expanded yet. But once the baby, and you know the baby is like, because sometimes it goes up, can and start to breathe, and that means the lungs is already uh, open up, and uh, the lacus, and once it goes back into the water, he'll be drowned. What about the vaccination? The vaccination, that, that they, they gave me four reasons. Uh, it seems that it's dangerous. It's not dangerous. It is, it's been investigated and researched for many, many years, and it's not dangerous. Of course, you have, when, when it's done, when it's given to a child, the child will have a fever. We adults also will have that. That's a reaction. But it's only minor, you yeah? And then some, they said it's haram. Some, uh, some ingredients which is haram for the Islam. It's not. If it ever told it's from sheep, can Takkan nak semelih itu semua nak halalkan dulu sebelum buat vaksin ni. No. Then why don't we think of the positive instead of the negative? Yeah? It's to help. It's to help children live. Okay? So that's one. Another one says that if you leave it to natural process processes, it, the child will still be immune. Have you to wait until the child is paralyzed with polio before you say, oh, now we, we have to have vaccine. It's too late. Too late. Polio... The vaccines are so simple. Now, the, b before it is suffered, it drops, the polio drops. Okay? And the last polio case that we had in Alastar was in an iron lung. The, the child, the, the boy, it's not the child, it's a boy, 
age about 15 years old, she had polio, paralyzed. And the, par the paralysis is going up into her his lungs. He had to be in this wooden box, like a coffin, which holds in it for his set to come out, and the windows for the nurses to put their hands in to nurse him. Would you like to see your son like that? I saw the last box in Alastair. And from then on, with the immunization program, we, we eliminated polio. We eliminated tuberculosis with our, with our uh, 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 Mantu test, BCG, BCG for babies, and then Mantu test for adults, mini x-rays and uh, uh, monitoring, x-rays also especially. We eradicated tuberculosis, we eradicated polio. Then malaria lagi. We eradicated, we have a malaria education program. I was in it. I saw all these things. And now, I feel so sad. Why are we going backwards? Okay? It's not Islamic at all to go backwards when you are given this child to make your mothers and your child alive, okay? to give all the opportunities for you to get all this treatment, for you to live longer, okay? and that you are just putting it aside. You know, I, I, I hope and uh, pray that all these uh, anti-campaigners will come back and say, yes, we are taking back the immunization. In your day as a woman doctor as well, uh, you broke some glass ceilings, you know. I, I think uh, I can remember my mother's time and my grandfather's would say, like, you know, women are not good for science, you know, but medical <laughs> doctor, you, you've broken that, that sort of glass ceiling. Do you think there's still glass ceilings in Malaysia to break? No, like, yeah. we, ha we have seen uh, women prime ministers in some of the neighbours, like yes. Indonesia and Thailand and even Philippines. Uh, but, you know, do you think there will be a day when we will see a woman prime minister in Malaysia? Probably there will be a day. I hope and pray there will be a day. But um, women must be very, very qualified. That that's the question that we have to, and we should admit and realize that we have to be very, very uh, knowledgeable. More qualified than the men? Yes, if possible. Yeah. We are ahead of men in some ways, mm -hmm. because we have now 75%, remember? 75% yeah. students in universities are women, mm -hmm. and the, the men are lacking behind. They are the hair, we are the rabbit, no. <laughs> okay? So, but we must be very, very qualified. Yeah, and to read, we must read everything that we can get hold of, not only of uh, what is how to be a leader and so forth, but uh, we learn from other leaders, okay? the autobiographies, history books, and uh, uh, what shall I say, um, the the things that they do for their own country, how they succeed, that is important. And not only that, we have to learn how to first thing to how to have good rapport with all levels of uh, our people. I that's my experience uh, actually. With uh, certain people, we have to go down. We have to be humble and go down to the level to talk to them. But from the middle side, then when they are more more educated, then it's a different level. You can to talk to them reasonably and you can reason out with them. But with the professionals, it's a different matter. Before, you, before they want to come and see you as a doctor, they go into the internet first. Okay? And then when they've seen what they want to know in the internet, then only they go to the doctor to complain what's wrong with her. And, and uh, she will be judging the doctor, whether okay? he is talking correctly or not about that particular condition. So it's difficult for a woman to become a leader if she's not knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. She must, and she must face these challenges. Challenges with uh, counterparts, with uh, people of different grades, as I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. and she must be very, very knowledgeable. If, that, if she has all that qualification, reasonable, and one thing, she has to be calm. Jangan mengelenting, as I said in the Malay says. Don't get uh, hot every time she's been criticized or whatever. She has to be calm and 
and uh, keep your image as a leader and uh, pretend that uh, everything is okay. Not to pretend, but, but really to see that it's okay. So that's my vision of a woman prime minister in Malaysia. Okay? We have examples in many countries of what they have been doing and what happened to them. So we learn from others to develop ourselves. Just, just one more question on med- medical. Your, um, I understand that. Um, you, I mean, you said you started off in pediatrics, and then actually you went to uh, you health. Know, uh, health, uh, women's health in particular, actually. Um, so I just want to ask, what do you see a lot of? Let's say, I mean, this is a problem that we still seem to have today, like child marriages. So, mm. what are your views on that? Do you see a lot of those cases back in your day? Is it the uh, same? Do we? St- Child marriages at that time are there, but I don't think it's a lot. It's nowadays that we, along the way, can we hear about child marriages. As soon as they have their menarche or their first period, they're considered a girl, a, a girl who can uh, get married, and she's fertile, mm-hmm. you know. It's sad. Mostly we have child marriages, not not child marriages, it's child uh, mothers, you know. Mm-hmm. Children, young mothers. Young mothers. Children become mothers, can, uh, in a case of the social problems. Uh, As okay. a medical professional, what do you think of it? It's, it's, not, it's not healthy mm-hmm. because the child's body is not mature enough mm-hmm. to, be, uh, to accommodate the uh, pregnancy, for example. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and, and, and she herself is not mature enough how to deal with a baby, her pregnancy, her baby, how to look after the baby. She will not be a good parent, mm-hmm. not a mature parent. And because then she has to look after the child, no, it's difficult. I won't, uh, I won't go along with child marriages, mm-hmm. yeah, for whatever reason or so. Mm-hmm. So, um, we, we can't get away from the that you were the Prime Minister's wife for 22 years. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so what, what would you say is, uh, what is the role of the Prime Minister's wife? You know, I've, I've read your autobiography and uh, you have gone to Iraq uh, and uh, to meet Saddam and then uh, Saddam Hussein and then you, when you, were, you were also in North Korea as well. And so what do you think a Prime Minister's wife's role is? Well, first and foremost, that um, you have to support your husband as a prime minister's wife. She's there to protect his image, his character, and his, uh, and of course to provide um, his needs. Yeah, that's what a wife's for. As a wife, can okay? as a wife you have to support him and. Uh, uh, to be with him for whatever he needs you for, yeah? And at the same time, you myself, you yourself must uh, take care of your own image, your own reputation, so that it will not damage him. Whatever you do yourself will reflect your husband, yeah? So this is something your wife has to be very careful about, yeah. And uh, the most important thing is to be with him, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, to ensure people that uh, he has a wife, and the wife is supporting him and taking care of him. That's important, and uh, it gives the husband, the prime minister, a sense of confidence also, okay? that whatever. Uh, whenever he's blue or down, he has a wife to comfort him. That's one of the roles of a wife, yeah, to, to love him during good days and bad times, and to love him always. So one thing I, uh, I, I, I uh, made myself clear that there should not be any competition between you and your husband. Of course, as a prime minister's wife, people will 
also expect you to play a role mm -hmm. as a leader, you know, in a woman's field or something. And uh, we'll invite you and ask you to talk and be with them and so forth. Yes, you have to do that because that will um, enhance your husband's image also. Mm -hmm. But be careful not to overstep your authority or your, your role, I mean your, her role, as a Prime Minister's wife. Don't take the role of a Prime Minister. No competition. Okay, leave it to your husband. You said supporting the one of the main roles is supporting the husband. So is this why you are still attending Charamas with uh, Dr. Mate at this time? <laughs> I, I, I attended it for many reasons. Okay. One is I want to listen to him because uh, when we campaign, I have we have will be separated, and I will do my part, and he will do his part, and I want to know. I want to know what he's talking, so that we we talk the same thing. Mm -hmm. To correct if he says something else, I say something else. Susah lah, yeah. That is one thing. And secondly, I want to I want to see to keep him calm, you know. And sometimes I have to be with him because sometimes he has got cough, and to make sure that something is there on the table for him to take a glass of water, for example, and to ensure that he is okay. So I'm there with him all the time just to listen. Sometimes people say, you always with me, yes, and you always listen to him. But it's not all the time I listen to him because I get bored, you know. Okay? Talking to, listening to the same uh, Charama. Charama, same story, okay? and, but uh, to him he says, you may be bored, but my audience is different, which is true. Can different audience can, the, the, who, who has not uh, heard of him before, so it, it was something new for them. But me listening to him every day, every night, and at home properly, can, I, sometimes I get bored, but I cannot say that. <laughs> can, otherwise he will be discouraged can, and he'll get angry. So I go along with him and give him a little bit of comments la, after that. Does he insist that you come along? Because some of his charamas now it be really late, even later than when he was Prime Minister. He's always slaughtered as the last speaker of the night. Yes. <laughs> that is something which I, I tried to uh, convince the organisers to please don't make him the last speaker. But they have a reason. Yeah. They always give me this reason. They make him last because... Uh, Otherwise, the crowd won't be there. So, making use of my husband. Lah. Okay. But 10.45 will be his speech, and then one hour. So, that means 11.45. And if it is in around Kuala Lumpur, okay, we come back early lah, before 12. But if it is in Pulai, in uh, Ketelah Dekat, Shah Alam, away from home, Penang, by the time we get home, it will be about one o'clock in the morning. And he must have his sleep. I insist that he go to sleep and not wake up early the next morning. That's just one uh, problem that we have. And it's just the night programs. But he has to be like that because the crowd will be there. And the, uh, it's after office hours then. And the organizers also do a lot of uh, organizing to get to get all this thing going. I noticed in your book, you know, you said that uh, when, when, when Dr. Mate stepped down, announced his retirement in 2002 at the Amno Assembly, he did not even tell you. True. Yeah. So my question is this, that um, when he decided to be active again last year, did he consult you? No, 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 no. He never consults me when he makes his decision. Thank you for staying with us and uh, this is the last part of our interview after um, with uh, Tun, Dr. Siti Hasma who has just told us about the difficult night charamas and how late it has been and how she's trying to convince the all you charama organizers there not to put Dr. Mate as the last person. So, um, just a, a couple of last questions here, yeah? Um, 
Undeniably, Dr. M or Dr. Mate has been in the forefront of many of the developments in politics in the country. Some of them have involved um, the sitting Prime Ministers, uh, Tunku in uh, 69, Pak La in 2009 or 2010, and now Najib. Okay. Did you at any point in time say, maybe it's time to take a rest? And say, yeah, when he retired, I thought uh, he would be resting and I would have him back into the family as a husband, as a father of our children. But uh, soon after that, he didn't, he did retire actually. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, it's good for a man who's, who has been working very hard not to retire entirely. Otherwise, they will soon deteriorate and then become uh, useless and passed on. But uh, not my husband, he was active. And especially when the, all these challenges come to, uh, come to him, he picked it up and started to become active again. So I cannot stop him because uh, I guess it is in his blood to be active, especially in politics. What do you say drives the two of you to, you know, still do this at 90? The drive is, we have only one objective, Chan. And then this is not only our objective, but also the true nation's objective. And that is to, how do you say, Selamatkan Malaysia, to rescue our beloved country from going downhill. We, have, we are facing a lot of problems, socio-economic problems and political problems. So we thought we have to start and um, start now and be aware and making other people to be aware also of what our situation is right now and to help our country to recover, get back to the, to the time when yeah, the economy is good, there's political stability, and there's solid, uh, united, multiracial country. That is what we are aiming for now. I understand that um, actually your family was very close to uh, even the late uh, Tun Razak because your brother studied with him in MCKK, uh, your brother Azmi, I think, I believe. And um, Aziz, uh, Aziz, sorry. Yeah. And uh, you were also close to Tun Raiha and uh, Tun Suhaila. So how how hard has it been for you personally to see your husband, um, you know, challenging Najib? Yes, I feel very sad because uh, I knew both families really. As, uh, as you say, Razak was with Aziz, my brother in MCKK. And uh, before, during the break from MCKK, he goes back to Pahang, to his home, and he, he, he always comes to our house, and that's how we personally knew him. And from then on, we knew the sister, the sisters, and uh, the brother-in-law, Hamza, who was in, in Alostar with us for some time. And then where Raha is concerned, my sister, my late sister Saleha, I knew them from uh, Dato Ong's days, and there they got to know each other, and uh, we knew Raha from her also. And uh, only yesterday, I'm very, very happy to meet with uh, uh, Tun Raha, and uh, we were we were friendly with each other, we hugged each other, and uh, we talked to each other, and uh, there's nothing between us. And uh, I told her that uh, we have her uh, in mind all the time. As for Tun Raza, he will be always, always, always in our mind. We are grateful to him for what he's done to, the, to our country. He has opened up the country for the rural people especially. And my husband is very grateful to him because he was the one who opened 
the channel for Mahathir to become a future Prime Minister. We are grateful to Tun Raza and we loved him as a great statesman in Malaysia. Final question. What would Dr. Hasma be if she had not met Dr. Mahathir in Singapore? I would not be here talking to you, Chan. <laughs> I would have been just a doctor, probably not marrying another doctor, and, uh, but uh, all those people who wanted to marry me before I went to Singapore during the Japanese occupation, my new, have all passed on. So I will be probably a single spinster doing my work with the people. I guess that's going to be my fate. Yeah. But fortunately, God blessed me for uh, meet, giving me the chance to meet with Mahathir in uh, Singapore. And I'm grateful for that because he taught me a lot of things in Singapore and also a lot of things when he took me back home as his wife in Kedah. I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful to the uh, people in Kedah and I'm also grateful to the late Agong, uh, Tuanku Sultan Abdul Halim, because he was the one at that time ruling Kedah. So I don't think I'll be happy without him. And I can't imagine being with another person except with him. So that's it. That's my story. <laughs> thank you, and that's a wrap for us. And thank you for staying with us and being okay. patient with us. Thank you, thank uh, you. And uh, until the next Facebook Live, uh, Sayonara from the Malaysian Insight. Thank you. Uh, thank you.